This is a terrifically exciting day. This is one of my most favorite topics to talk about. Cast iron. And specifically, cast iron pots and pans from the 19th century. Now you might be saying to yourself, my god, this guy is a dork. I have bought and sold a lot of mid-century and prior cast iron over the years. It's still one of my most favorite things to flip, and sometimes I keep some and sometimes I don't. To keep from this video going hours on end, I'm scoping it down to 19th and 20th century cast iron pots and pans. I'm really only going to glaze over the 19th century stuff because it's not that common to come across. There is money there and I'm going to tell you a tip on how to identify and pick those up. I'm also not going to talk about other things that are made out of cast iron that are household items and that there could be money in. That's an entire video all into itself. Things like kitchen items like food mills or piggy banks that move back and forth. Also things like lawn ornaments could be made out of cast iron in the 19th century and still carry some resale value to this day. I'm mainly going to cover six different topics. It seems like a lot, but we should have a little bit of fun doing it and you should learn something. So get a pen and paper, grab a hot cocoa, and let's get into it. The six areas I'm going to go over are the Wagner Company, the Griswold Company, the Lodge Company, the Birmingham Stove Company, unmarked cast iron, and Asian cast iron. Now by far, these are the companies and, and cast iron pots and pans that you're going to come across. And where are you going to come across these things? As a disclaimer, the first two, Wagner and Griswold, already have a high mark on them. Meaning, not even resellers, antique people, the general public might know about Griswold and Wagner. So you're not necessarily going to be able to score these on like Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace because the average citizen might have a clue that there may be some money into it. Now that being said, I've pulled a lot of old Wagner and Griswold out of estate sales. Sometimes estate companies just see it as an old pot or pan and don't realize what they're sitting on. So if this is something that you're interested in getting in, the next time you go to an estate sale, make a beeline for the kitchen. Now before we really dive in, I wanted to give you a quick rule of thumb. I'm talking about 19th and 20th centuries. So from the 1800s to the 2000s is what the scope of this video is gonna cover. You go, well, how do I know what's old in there? Something from the 1990s is in the range that you just talked about and clearly that's not gonna be worth anything and you're absolutely right. So in the terms of 19th century stuff, from 1800 to 1910 or so, the manufacturing process for cast iron was a little bit different. If you come across a cast iron pot that has a mark that looks like this, that's called a flash mark or a gate mark. And it's indicative of the manufacturing process that they used during that hundred year span. When they filled up the mold, they actually filled it up on the flat part and they physically broke the tab off where the cast iron was poured in and then they filed it down smooth. It was good enough for the time, but it's a really, really good indicator. If you come across a pot on the bottom that has that scar on it, you might be onto something. Definitely pick it up and do a quick inspection on it. And when you're inspecting, what are you looking for? Just make sure it's not cracked. Cast iron is extremely durable and resilient and will last for hundreds of years, but it's very brittle. It doesn't take kindly to being dropped. So if you pick it up and it rings, it's probably still good. Here's another good rule of thumb. In the early 1960s, the United States mandated that all pots and pans have their country of manufacture put on them. Now the law went both ways. So if you happen to pick up a cast iron pot and it says made in USA on it, more than likely it was made after 1960. And what I mean by it went both ways, if you pick up a cast iron pot and it says made in Germany or made in Denmark, it's after 1960, no matter what the condition is. So it's really not that, that old. Now you're saying, well, you left off in 1900, you came back in 1960. What about that 60 year time frame? Good question. Another rule of thumb that you can look out for is something like this. Now you see around the outside of the pan, that's called a heat ring. That heat ring is a good indicator of something from prior to 1940 or so. Now, despite what the name says, it doesn't actually heat any better. That heat ring was on the bottom because back in ye olden days, people had wood burning stoves. And if you've ever seen a picture of an old wooden stove, they have holes in the top of the stove top. 
the heat ring was there so that when you put the pot down, it wouldn't slide around. It would kind of get locked into that that ring. As stoves got more modern, cast iron pot and pan companies said we don't have to add that additional material anymore and they've since been removed, like I said, starting in about the 1940s or so. This is a modern day lodge cast iron skillet. If you can see here, it says USA. So they're by the law that we just talked about. Being that it's modern, it doesn't have a heat ring around it. This is actually a groove. I don't know if you can see that, but if you look at it this way, there's no protruding heat ring. You'll also see that there's a size. This is a size 14 and SK. SK stands for skillet. Out of the companies that I mentioned earlier, Wagner, Griswold, Birmingham, and Lodge, Lodge is the only one that's still in business today. They're still manufactured here in the US. I believe they're out of Pennsylvania. Lodge has been around a really long time. One of the easiest ways that you can identify some old lodge and perhaps a money maker is when you have a pot that has a heat ring on it, there will be notches in the heat ring at 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. They did that from approximately the 1940s until the 1970s. 1970s, not that old, not a ton of money there, but again, it's a quick rule of thumb, something you could put in the back of your mind to be on the lookout for. They also didn't put their name, Lodge, on the pots until the late 1970s or 1980s. But one of the things that does remain consistent throughout their history is like I showed you, the size, and they always did an abbreviation of what the pot is. This is SK for skillet. You might see something that says 8DO, 8 Dutch oven, but it doesn't have a name. So it's a pretty good indicator that it's a lodge and it's older than 1975. One way to make sure that it's before the 1970s, arguably one of the best inventions in the cast iron world. They didn't put this second handle on until the mid 70s. So through your power of deduction, if you have an unmarked cast iron pot, that has abbreviations on it, a size number, but it doesn't have a second handle, more than likely, it's an old lodge. Definitely pick it up and make sure it rings. Don't buy broken cast iron. And since I've introduced you to the size numbers, let me go off on a tangent. Size numbers actually have no relation to a tape measure. Every company's size number was different from the company next to it. If you ever bought kids clothes, you'll know that the companies put numbers on them that really don't correspond to anything else, only their own. So a size 14 lid would fit on a lodge, but it might not fit on a Griswold. And like I said, they didn't have anything to do with the tape measure. They're holdovers from ye olden days. Remember those holes in the stove that I talked about? Stove manufacturers will put different size holes on the top, not dissimilar to modern day where you have different size burners, and the heat ring would correspond, roughly, to the stove manufacturer's rings on top. The size numbers, even though they were slightly different with different manufacturers, generally corresponded to a size. They ranked all the way from a zero, which would be things like novelty items, like cast iron shaped ashtrays, or coasters, all the way up to such as that, a 15 inch size 14. And then you might get into unnumbered objects like larger pieces of cast iron, things like skillet tops or paella pans. Those are worth big, big money, like thousands. Before we get wrapped up with this gigantic pot, there's one more thing I wanted to show you to differentiate new cast iron, which isn't really worth much, except when you're buying at retail, and vintage and old cast iron, which is worth something. You see the angle here? It's a rather obtuse angle. That's a modern day thing. In the old days, being that there was wood burning stoves, they needed the heat to transfer up. So older cast iron, obviously older than this, the angle is much more vertical. It's still there, but it's not nearly as wide as that. So keep that in mind as a rule of thumb for aging old cast iron. The next company that I want to talk about, and arguably the most famous in regards to vintage and antique cast iron, is Wagner. Wagner was an American cast iron company that was around from 1891 to around 1959. They kind of fizzled out at the end there. When they were merged together with arguably the other big dog, Griswold. They were bought out by a company named Textron, and then eventually to another company named GHC, where they were driven into the ground like all good corporations do. The Wagner name was revived in the 1990s, but it was a shadow of its former self. 
If you come across Wagner with a logo like this, it doesn't mean it was made in 1991. It was a centennial anniversary version made in 1991, and it's not, and it's only worth is scrap. Don't bother picking it up. So how do you ID a Wagner? Simple. Their logo went through many iterations over the years. And being that it wasn't that long ago, it has a relatively good documented history of what time frames they use certain logos. Also, Wagner was good about not abbreviating anything. It'll say six and a half inch skillet in full typewriter block letters. But there's an exception, like there isn't everything else in life. In order to maintain their status, Wagner made an unbranded line that took their logo off but kept that distinct typewriter font on it. They're known as unbranded Wagners, and these would be sold at Woolworths or Five and Dimes as opposed to the branded ones which would be sold in places like Macy's. They weren't dumb back then, they knew exactly what they were doing. They were selling the same exact product, adding one more manufacturing step to it and jacking the price up and selling it at a higher price at a bigger store. The next company that we have to talk about is Griswold. Griswold was a cast iron company from around the late 1800s to 1959 when it was merged with Wagner and subsequently ran into the ground. There is a tremendous history on Griswold and it's far more. I could do a whole video on Griswold pots alone. Basically the same rules that I said for Wagner apply to Griswold as well. They're usually well marked. There's gonna be intricacies in dating them, but they're almost definitely gonna be worth more than you buy them for when you come across them in an estate sale or a garage sale. You have very strong collectors in either of these markets. You have people who just collect Griswold, you have people who just collect Wagner, and then you have people who collect everything. It might be made out of cast iron, but for us, it's like gold. So be on the lookout for any number of these variations. And as a side note, not dissimilar to Wagner, there also were unbranded versions of Griswold for the same reason. One of the ways that you can identify Griswold is this unique handle design. The ridge that runs up the back. Also, a little bit later on, they had what was called the Iron Mountain series with this very unique looking handle. It wasn't labeled Griswold, but collectors know it as a Griswold. The next vintage or antique cast iron company that you might come across is the Birmingham Stove Company. That's Birmingham, Alabama, not England. On those, their distinctive feature is a solid, unbroken heat ring. There's no notches in it. They usually only had two letters on them, which would be the size and whatever mold they were made from. Also, look at the bottom of the handle. It has that sharp ridge that runs into the pot doesn't stop on the handle. That's a design feature pretty well known on the Birmingham's. One note about Birmingham's is their heat ring, even though at this point it was just a vestige of history, they ran their heat ring later into the 1960s, well after its functional use. So it makes it a little bit harder to date those. But if you see that funny handle, you should probably pick it up. I'd like to talk about Asian cast iron. Asian cast iron became very popular in the 1970s here in the United States. Asian cast iron generally sticks out for its rougher texture. It's not worse, it's just rougher. They generally came with wooden handles built in like shown here. And despite any rumors that you might have heard about them being made out of pot metal or whatever Chineseium there is out there, they're completely fine to use and they're, they're a staple in households across the country to this day. Are they worth it for reselling? Probably not. Are they worth it to cook with? Absolutely. Oh, and one more identifying feature of Asian cast iron pots is they'll have ridges where your thumb would go on the handle. Almost no American made cast iron came with that. So if you see that thumbprint, it's almost definitely gonna be from Taiwan where the majority of the Asian cast iron was made. So there's one more thing that I wanted to talk about. Like everything else in reselling, condition is king. Before we can talk about price, you have to talk about condition. If there's one thing that I don't want you to be dissuaded by when you're looking at vintage cast iron, and that's dirt. Stickiness is gonna happen with vintage cast iron. Don't think that that's something that you can, one, not just clean off yourself, 
or two might dissuade a potential buyer from buying from you because it's dirty. That's okay. Rust, on the other hand, is something that you want to be considerate of. If the thing is a big rusty mess, it's going to affect the price. And the big one when it comes to vintage cast iron and condition is whether it lays flat or not. If you push the handle and it rocks back and forth, more severe the rock, the less you're going to get for it. Another way to check for a flat bottom is if you spin the handle. If you're to lay this thing down flat and it doesn't move, we know the bottom's flat. If you push the handle and it spins like a top, no collector wants it. No matter how old it is. That means the bottom is warped, it's not going to cook right, and it's certainly not gonna display right. And the big thing that everyone wants to know, what are some numbers? We covered a lot of topics, and depending on condition, depending on company, and depending on age, these pots can go in the $40 range to the $1,000 range. Most of them are gonna fall in the between $40 and $100 range, and with rarity and condition, the next level is gonna be in the $100 to $200 range. If you were to find something really rare or really big, regardless of condition, it's not uncommon for them to go over a thousand dollars. They're not very common, but they are out there. So keep it in mind when you're about to purchase. If you're, if these things are priced for a couple of bucks and you come across them, pick it up. A couple of bucks into 40 is a good flip. A couple of dollars into a couple hundred dollars is an even better flip. And since these are collector's items, don't do free shipping. Do calculated shipping with them. People are going to pay for it. They know they're big. They know they're heavy. They know they're going to be packed well. So don't be afraid to put calculated shipping on. That's just the nature of this item. Now while the big companies in the, in the collectibles block are Wagner and Griswold, there are other companies out there that are just as old, but the prices might not be as high just yet. Some of those companies are Martin, Volrath, which is still in business but they haven't made cast iron pots and pans since like World War II, and Chicago Hardware. Chicago Hardware easily identifiable by that hammered finish that's on the side. While they might not command the prices that Griswold or Wagner do, there's no reason to let these things languish or perhaps even go to the scrapyard. They're still excellent to cook with, and depending on the piece, they might actually be worth money. So as far as I'm concerned, when I see vintage cast iron, I almost always pick it up. Now one other note, like I said in the beginning, this just covers pots and pans. These companies made a number of different products from cornbread skillets, corn on the cob holders, and cupcake molds. Not dissimilar to modern companies these days. Now just like the items themselves, the prices on these things vary. I've pulled a number of these out of Goodwills over the years. People just don't realize, they just see it as an old hunk of metal. So while not exactly in the scope of this video, if you see the name Griswold or Wagner and any of the other clues that I threw in there on these products, definitely pick them up. And being that I posted on my IG today about this topic and I showed a great example of what could happen if you don't treat these things well, here's a note about shipping them. Like I said earlier, Cast iron can literally last centuries, and they actually only get better with age if you treat them properly. But they don't take kindly to any shocks or abuse. You could overheat a cast iron pan by just leaving it on the stove and it could crack. I always tell people, if you're gonna sell and ship cast iron, even though it's heavy and it's a brute and it looks like it's bulletproof, it needs to be shipped as if it was glass. That's how brittle they could be especially when they get older. Don't blame the weather, don't blame age and rust, or it's just the composition of the material. So treat vintage cast iron as if you would treat vintage Pyrex. Ship it with care. If you like this sort of video, go ahead and click here, click here, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Keep sending them.